Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Sustainable Engineering and the Environment course. Um, um, I hope you all had a great start into the new year, 2021. Unfortunately, this year again, um, the lecture will be entirely online. If the situation changes, we, will, we might meet towards the end of the course, but the entire course will be online. That's why we are meeting in this virtual Zoom meeting. I'm going to share my um, screen one moment. Um, share my screen and lectures. So you all should have received an email yesterday um, with the information about the course, where you have um, where you have the link to the course material and also the link to this Zoom um, online meeting. It will always be the same link, Zoom link, so you can always click on the same um, link to join the lectures. <clears throat> so again, um, um, welcome everyone to this course. Um, I, would like you, I would like to ask you to give me a th um, thumbs up just to see that everybody can hear me and that all the, the technology works and that the microphones work. So please give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. I'm just checking now if everybody can hear me. I think I think almost everybody can hear me. Okay, great. Um, if you cannot hear me, um, please write me a mail or a message or um, unfortunately, if you can't hear me, you can't hear what I'm saying right now. But um, yeah, we will have to figure something out. Um, but most of you can hear me. <clears throat> So I would like to start the course before I go further into detail um, about this phrase that has been coming up in the recent years, um, is the house on fire? Um, you might have heard it that in the newspaper sometimes there was, a, there was this phrase coming up, the house is on fire, referring to our world, that there's an environmental crisis, a crisis, a climate crisis. And I would like to start um, with a short video that I would like to play to you um, just to initiate the entire course, the motivation of this course. And um, so I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna switch over to the video that I would like to play for you. So th since this is online and it's gonna be streamed through my computer onto your computer, you might want to check out the, um, the, the, the video might be delayed. So in this case, you will find the link in the, um, in the Dropbox in the slides and you can, um, look into it um, one second but um, so I'm sorry for the delay but I unfortunately cannot change this very much um, but I'm going to play this video it's only a 50 seconds long and afterwards we're going to have a discussion about it there's no sound David. Yes, I'm trying to put on the sound. One second. Okay, I'm going to put on the sound. One second. I'm having troubles with the sound. So, um, where do I do this? Share sound. Okay, here comes the sounds as well. Then we're going to restart and then go. You have to go. Okay, this was a very short clip. I'm going to share again my uh, slides um, right here. And I want to use this short sequence. Of course, this is a, a, a movie from, from a Scandinavian filmmaker about a couple that goes to the European Alps and has, uh, does some skiing vacation. And there's this avalanche coming. And um, of course, it's an um, entire, um, um, it's, it's just a movie. But sometimes this video sequence has been referred to as 
the situation the world is on when we are looking at the projections of climate change projections or environmental crises projections that we are um, at the turning point where we reach the tipping points of some of the critical livelihoods of the world. And this is what I wanna, would like to address within, within, uh, within this lecture and, th and this course during the next 12 weeks. And what I wanna point out, so if you make the, the link towards what's in the world happening, you could see the avalanche that goes towards the people sitting on this nice terrace and enjoying the sun as the pollution, the resource depletion, the climate change, the waste problem, the biodiversity loss, the extreme weather, the deforestation, and the soil degradation. <clears throat> so some scientists say that we are in a state where we have seven to, uh, regarding the 1.5 degrees Celsius um, climate target, we have about seven years left if we continue business as usual um, regarding um, um, other, one of other, other aspects of the environmental crisis, we have a little bit more time left, but these are the projections. And what I wanna point out is that through engineering, um, we have the, put the opportunity, the business opportunity and the technology, the technology to meet these challenges and to mitigate the, the impacts of what's coming towards us and to try to um, live in a more sustainable way. For example, we have, um, we have technology to prevent the expected impacts. We can reduce emissions. We can compensate some of the impacts we have. We can do mitigation. We can anticipate the, the, the impacts that are coming towards us. We can adapt. And of course, all this um, creates technology and business opportunities. And that's the main purpose of this course, how to deal with the challenge of the, of the environmental crisis and the climate crisis and what business opportunities and technological opportunities are there for sustainable engineering to address those challenges and to come up with sol solutions to anticipate these challenges we are facing. And I do believe, it's my sincere belief that those nations or those societies that anticipate these um, impacts now or ahead of time, they have, will have an advantage also economically in the future. If you continue living, um, you could compare it like, like this guy here, just looking at the avalanche, looking out there and, and thinking, okay, everything is okay. It could be that they will experience some severe um, impacts once the, once the situation degenerates. And that is mostly what I would like to address within this course within the next 12 weeks. And I would also like to give you the opportunity to work on a project based on your background to address one of those challenges. <clears throat> so, um, so again, I've mentioned this uh, um, climate emergency that some people point out. Of course, this is not something that I invented. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a scientific consensus that we are currently in, um, in a situation where climate change will impact on the livelihood worldwide. You can look this up. There are numerous scientists that have published, perhaps one of the most um, astonishing publications just came out last year or two years ago in November 19 by Ripple et al. Um, the publication is also in the Dropbox. I will get back to the Dropbox uh, um, in just a few moments where you can find some of those references, um, scientific references. And keep in mind, these are, uh, uh, these are scientific references that are published in really well-established journals. Um, so, and these are really consortium that are quite large with many scientists that come together worldwide that um, come up with those projections. So just to point out that this video and this, um, this, this concept of climate crisis is not something that I made up, but that comes from the global um, scientific consensus. <clears throat> I also would like to um, welcome you to the first lecture that is jointly taught by the Energy Institute of the Johannes Kepler University in Austria and Reykjavik University in um, Iceland, of course. So, um, Currently, I have two positions, um, one at the Energy Institute of the Johannes Kepler University in Linz, and also I'm a lecturer at Reykjavik University in Iceland. And the two universities have a agreement, an Erasmus agreement, so it is possible if you're interested to um, visit Austria, get funding from the European Union through the 
um, Erasmus Plus program and um, do part of your project work or your thesis or even an exchange semester within the Energy Institute of um, the Johannes Kepler University in Linz. <clears throat> so just to point out the two universities, I would like to point this out. Reykjavik University, you know this all, it has been established in 1998. Ari Jonsson is the rector of um, our university. We have about 300 staff members, um, about 100 administrative staff and roughly 3,500 students. Probably it has been increasing in the last years. I don't know exactly the exact numbers for the upcoming years. <clears throat> and um, if you compare this to the Johannes Kepler University, Johannes Kepler University is almost six times larger. So it has in 2016 it had 18,000 students. Um, it was established in 1966. And the Energy Institute is similar to Reykjavik University, closely linked to the energy sector in Austria. Um, Austria has the policy to switch over to entirely renewable energy production by the year 2030. About three quarters of the Austrian energy is produced with, or electricity is produced with hydropower. So this is an, another in, interesting link to Iceland because the energy system is similar to what is Iceland has. Iceland has also between 70, 75% of the electricity pro production coming from hydropower. Um, and um, there's also a, a very um, energy intensive industry in Linz where you, could, where, you can, where you have similar aspects than in Iceland where you have of course a, a, a strong aluminium sector or um, um, heavy industry where heavy industries use up a lot of the electricity to produce um, aluminium and, and other um, metallic um, products. <clears throat> So the reason why I point this out is because we can um, establish collaborations, we can exchange technology, we can exchange know-how between the universities. And since the two settings are similar with hydropower as being one of the main energy resource, uh, energy resource for ele electricity production, and the use of the electricity is similar because of the, of the heavy industries and the, uh, and um, which use up a lot of the energy. Um, maybe there are synergies that we can develop where we can learn from experts between the two universities um, through this collaboration. <clears throat> so to come back to my person, I just want to say a few words to myself. So um, I was born in Austria, but I grew up in Switzerland and my research focuses on water resources, low carbon energy, numerical modeling, and environmental monitoring, uh, uh, monitoring. So usually what I do, I go into um, um, new areas. I look at the water resources and I estimate how much energy we can produce or also how much water is needed for the environment. Of course, the environment is an important aspect also to preserve the, the, the wilderness is also an important aspect. And by assessing how much water is available, um, there's always a trade-off between renewable energy and um, pristine nature and preservation of the, of the wilderness in the area. <clears throat> so this is a little bit um, my research area. I'm going to go into the different, uh, different projects during the next two hours. And in the teaching part, there are four courses that I teach, environmental impact assessment course. I, I noticed that some of you have already been in the environmental impact assessment course uh, last December. So I welcome you back to my lecture. Thank you very much for uh, joining on my lecture again. Um, and um, so, but the environmental impact assessment course is really a three week course. It's quite intense. It's uh, three weeks, eight hours a day um, where the students mostly work on a project. The, the sustainable engineering and environment course. So this course or environmental engineering, as I, as I called it at the beginning, um, is a 12 week course. So it's a bit more relaxed. We have um, over 12 weeks, we will um, touch upon different topics. There's a slight overlap. So those students who have already attended the, um, the environmental impact assessment course, I will point it out once we get to those lectures that have similar content. So it's up to you to, to to see if, it, if you would like to join the, the lecture, if there's an overlap with the environmental impact assessment course. Mm. Then field workshop 
so this is a bit tricky, tricky, critical. Usually I like to take students out into the field, do measurements of environmental processes, and then discuss the results. Unfortunately, this year, due to the COVID-19 situation, this is not possible. Um, we will see maybe it is possible to do a field day in March. Um, I'm still discussing this with the um, administration of Reykjavik University, but we will have to um, see how the situation develops. Um, and hydrology is also a big topic that I um, teach from time to time. <clears throat> So please, if there are any questions, please just type them in the chat of the Zoom, um, of the Zoom meeting so that I can then um, address them once we, um, um, when I see them and, um, and, and we can discuss your questions as well. One second, I'm just gonna check if I can put on the side. So I have the chat open. So if there are any questions, just feel free to type them into the chat of the Zoom meeting. So, um, so before I start um, with the content of the lecture, I would like to um, ask you, um, where are you from? And, and for this, we have prepared um, also, so, um, so this question is a very simple question, where are you from? But it's also to get to know each other and also to get to know the technology, because usually I use this um, software menti.com where you can connect with your web browser or you could do it also over your cell phone. Um, you can just connect to the cell phone and then um, answer the questions where you're from. So I'm gonna do this right now. I'm gonna stop sharing. And I would like to ask you um, if, uh, so Yangshu, you're sharing your screen or should I do, should I share it? Yes, so Yangshu is the teaching assistant. Um, please also, you will have to hand in all your exercises, your weekly exercises um, um, to Yang Shu by email. It's also written in the assignment sheets. And so now I would like to ask you to log into menti.com, type in the code 75135082 and answer the question, um, where are you from? Just so that you get a feeling of where people in the class are from and, um, so that you get to know a little yeah, each other a little bit better. Of course, there are a lot of people from Iceland. We have some people from Kenya, Germany, um, Indonesia. So we're very international. Um, Spain is here, France is here. So we have a very international group. I think 12, um, uh, United States is here as well. Welcome to, welcome to the United States um, was there. Some more, I think this is more or less it. Okay, so we, we see that we have, we're have quite international group, which is a very good for such a project for, 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 for the course, because obviously um, sustainability is a global problem and we have to address it from a global perspective. So I'm very happy to have a very international um, a group of people in, uh, in this group. So Peru is also joining us. So um, I think then we're gonna stop sharing. We all knew how this works. And then I'm gonna share again the lecture slides. Go back here and so, yeah, so, so good. We will always from time to time have short questions where we use menti.com just to have an interaction with the students um, on various different topics. <clears throat> Um, so now, um, so a little bit of about the organiz organizational stuff. So this is the first part of the lecture, um, the organizational stuff, since it's all online and since there might be students from other university joining and using the Dropbox link to fa facilitate the interaction with students from different universities. And um, so please use the Dropbox link. You should have received the email last yesterday night. But um, for those of you who um, um, are, have not seen it or so, you can find the Dropbox link right here, down here. Um, and, and there you will have all the slides from every lecture I give, all the assignment sheets. There will be weekly assignments where you have to do some engineering um, 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 exercises. And you will also find all the literature that I mentioned during the class in the Dropbox link. 
I think there is a question from the chat. I'm going to take a look. Where is the chat? Yep. Um, I'm having trouble opening the chat. I'm sorry. How why does this not work? Uh, yeah, okay, so Yang Shu sent the link to the Dropbox um, in the chat. So just open the chat and then you will see that the, the, the link that is uh, in the, in the, on, the, on, the, on the slide right here. Um, yeah, so administrative stuff. Um, so welcome to the course called Sustainable Engineering and Environment. It starts today, 11th of January. It will end on 2nd of April. It's two times a week. Um, Tuesday, we will have always lectures. So that's where I'm going to be talking or maybe someone else is going to present something. Um, it's typically from 10.10 until 12.30 Iceland time. And um, then there is, um, and then on Thursday, we will discuss the exercises and you will have time to present your project that you're working. I hope that we can have it as interactive as possible. So, um, so this will be always on Thursday. We will meet for two and a half an hours, hours and discuss the exercises that you will be given for each week. And <clears throat> if possible, we will, I would like to try to schedule a field day for the 9th of March. So this is a very tentative date. I'm not sure if it's possible, but if possible, I would like to schedule it on, on the 9th of March. The field day, day will be a full day excursion. So um, you will be um, compensated by having one other day where there will be no lecture so that you can compensate for the efforts that you do during the field day. But if you want to join the field day and if we are able to um, organize it, then you will have to we will leave in the morning, probably at eight o'clock with the bus and we will come back in the evening um, uh, and, and you will not be able to attend other courses or do other things during the field day. Of course, if you have an, an, another commitment, um, we will just discuss it and you might do another exercise instead of joining the field excursion. But anyway, due to the COVID-19 situation, I'm not sure if the field day can take place this year. <clears throat> Very important, on the 23rd and 30th of March, you will have to present your sustainable engineering project where you show, based on your background, um, where you address a topic and show how you can make this topic more sustainable. The topic is up to you. Um, I suggest, of course, that you um, choose a topic that you're especially interested in, of course, and also where you have um, a certain knowledge already, where you have already a background. You, um, I, I suppose that you are all master students, um, so you should have already from your bachelor studies, undergraduate studies, some experience where you could, that you can take into this course and develop it further um, by the by the different concepts we discuss during the next twelve weeks, and um, then present how you can make the topic you present more sustainable. <clears throat> So of course, I think the project that you deliver is the most important part of this course, because the course is all about um, enabling and empowering you to, to, to do, do the project you would like to do. Um, of course, there will be also a grade, you will be evaluated, your work, your project will be evaluated. Um, and because the most important thing is the project, you will also have the biggest part in the final grade. The final grade is composed of 50% of the grade is the project that you hand in. 25% um, is the presentation of your final project and 25% is the final report that you hand in. Um, we'll go over how to write the report um, later on in the lecture. And the other 50% come from the exercises that you will have to do every week so these are simple engineering exercises um, where every week you will have, um, you will get a, a, a sm small, usually numerical exercise um, where you have to do some calculations. And this will be of course graded um, and this counts 40% and 10% is simply participating in the course. 
um, by showing up to the lectures. Um, and the exercises are not going to take attendance during the exercises. Um, it's up to you to use the Thursday lectures to get um, to get help to do the exercises or get help on your project and to contact me or, or also Young Shu to get help with, with the work that you have to deliver for the course. Um, what, how are we doing in time? I think we're doing okay. So this is the tentative program of the next 12 week. Today is a pure introduction lecture. I'm just gonna present the different, the, 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 the structure of the course. And I'm also gonna present some of the ongoing um, research projects that we have at Reykjavik University and also in, in Austria at the Energy Institute in Linz so that, um, so that you get an overview of what is possible in environmental engineering or sustainable engineering if you want. If you want. Next week will be um, a lecture on environmental concerns and disasters. Um, so this lecture is very much similar to, um, to the lecture that I gave at, on the first day of the environmental impact assessment course. So those students who have already attended the, the, the course environmental impact assessment last December, um, you're, of course, you're welcome and you're very much welcome to join the course and, and to maybe participate in the discussions. But it's very similar. So I understand if you would like to um, skip the course and um, rather focus on, uh, on doing, or focus on, on advancing your um, sustainable engineering project. In the week three, we will do um, risk and life cycle frameworks. So we'll look into how to assess the risk. Life cycle analysis is a very powerful tool to assess the environmental impacts and the sustainability of a project or um, a product. So we'll go, um, we'll focus in the third week on, on the LCA. In the fourth week, we'll look at environmental law and re regu regulations. So here we will look into the different um, legislations um, and especially the environmental impact assessment legislation. In week five, we will look at green and sustainable materials. There we will look into how much resources are still available, how fast are we using up the resources that are available. And there are some resources where if we continue to use them as we are doing right now, it, um, it will only be available in the same amount for the next couple of decades. Other resources are available for longer time periods. So this is a bit what we would like to address in week six. <clears throat> In week seven, we will have um, examples and, um, and we will use the software of LCA. So this year we put a, a lot of emphasis on LCA because we have two weeks actually that focus on LCA, um, simply because it's a very powerful tool to assess the sustainability of different products and really compare what is more sustainable than others. And you will also get the possibility to use the software Open LCA and do some of the um, uh, do some exercises with OpenLCA um, um, and calculate the life cycle assessment um, of different products. Mm. Then week eight, we will focus on water resources, climate change, and hydropower. Um, so I put a lot of emphasis on in, in week eight on on water resources. First of all, because it's really my background and my um, uh, um, what, what I've been focusing on mostly on in the last years, but also because electricity production in Iceland is dominated by hydropower with almost three quarters of the energy um, coming from hydro, of the electricity coming from hydropower um, um, sources. And it's similar in Switzerland and in Iceland where hydropower is one of the main electricity sources. And hydropower is a renewable energy source that is very flexible because you can turn it off and turn it off within a few seconds. But if you have a storage unit like a, a, a reservoir, and this is a, actually a very powerful tool, um, especially regarding the new changing um, um, electricity market and electricity demand. I mean, if you think about um, that, a lot of uh, sectors are switching over to electrification. Um, hydropower becomes a, a very efficient tool of providing peak power when it's needed, rather than simply producing electricity um, um, as, a, as a ground um, energy production. Mm. 
Um, we'll go into the details about this all when we uh, come, to, come to that topic. And then week nine and 10 are really case studies in Iceland. <clears throat> I mean, week nine would be the field day if we can do it. Otherwise we will have, uh, we will look at different case studies from Iceland. <coughs> and week 10, we will take, uh, we'll look at case studies in Europe um, and, and also see what are the, what are the engineering projects, the sustainable engineering projects ongoing in, uh, at our partner university in Austria in Linz. <coughs> And the last two weeks are really focused on, the, on your project. So we'll divide it up um, into um, two blocks um, so that we have enough time to have a presentation about 20 minutes and then five minutes discussion of each project where you can present your project and then also write a report about it. Um, any questions so far? Okay, if there are no questions, I will just be continuing talking. Um, <clears throat> So this is a picture from the field day. This was from, um, I think, uh, three years ago where we were quite a lot of people and we went up. So the field day, um, since it's a spring semester, it's always about snow hydrology. So we look at the thickness of the snow, the density of the snowpack, and we calculate um, the amount of water in the snowpack in, in a certain water catchment. And this is especially interesting um, because if you know how much water is available, you can know how much water should be used for environmental purposes, for irrigation, and also for hydropower production by simply knowing how much water will be melting in spring. And you can anticipate how much energy you will be producing during the summer and during the spring when the snow starts to melt. And in this way, you can already assess, do you need um, other energy sources for the summer? And you can make the energy system more efficient simply by um, predicting how much water will be available and then um, adapting existing infrastructure to, um, to a more efficient energy production. And also, of course, more efficient um, um, irrigation. Irrigation is maybe not so relevant in Iceland because there's enough water available, but in other areas of the world, um, water availability um, is a big issue um, um, and water is a very valuable resource. So um, we would like to address this also and then put it also in context, in a global context where in other areas of the world where uh, water is a lot more a scarce resource. Mm. So this is a picture of uh, Reykjadalur, the, the geothermal hot spring um, just outside Reykjavik city. It's, um, if you go to Hveragerdi and you can hike up there, it's about um, a five kilometer hike. Usually um, we make our snow hydrology excursion into Reykjadalur um, where we just measure the snow depth, we look at the density. And maybe this year we also will look, we'll be looking at isotopic signals in the water. Um, this is still um, not yet de de defined, but if possible, I would like to do one day in March where we would go into the field. And of course, um, keep in mind, if we do a field work, you would have to get dressed very warm, uh, um, very warm because it can be very harsh winter conditions in, in Iceland. <clears throat> okay, um, so um, no important, so what's important for you are the deadlines. Um, there's every, Thursday of the following week, you will be asked to hand in the results of your assignment. There's a weekly assignment where you will simply have to um, answer, do the exercises and hand it in um, by email to Yangshu, where you send in the, the, your uh, a PDF file, where you answer the questions off the assignment sheet and you hand it in to Yangshu, the teaching assistant, by email by sending him um, to Shu16 at ru.is. Um, then the field day, I already discussed this. Uh, discussed this. Um, the field day is a bit special because there, um, instead of having an exercise that you will have to do during that week, you will present the results from the field day a week later um, so that we can discuss how to anticipate snow melt and energy production in the area or water available in the area. Um, based on the results that you have collected during the field. <clears throat> but again, this uh, remains to be seen how the situation develops. 
um, if we, we cannot do the field day, then we will have uh, a simply online lectures as mentioned pre previously. Um, also, what I would like to ask you, so this is quite important. Um, I think I have here a typo because 5th of February is uh, um, not quite sure, but what I would like you to do is to prepare your project idea for next Thursday. So if you have already a project idea um, that you would like to work on within your sustainability project, please present it this upcoming Thursday. Um, it's only a five minute presentation. I just wanna make sure that everybody gets started within the first two weeks of the course because time goes very fast and I would like you to use the 12 weeks to work on your project and to come up with a project that is um, sustainable um, and, and to, so that we can also discuss the, the process of working on your project. So please, if you have already an idea, feel free to pre present it this Thursday already. So um, in two days when we meet again, um, otherwise you will have one week and you can present it next Thursday. Um, um, yeah. So you can do, there are two types of projects. You can do either a project just during the 12 weeks or you can do a preparatory project preparing for a potential master thesis where you would like to investigate what you did within this course within a master thesis in the next semester. It's also possible um, if of course the topic of your project is um, sustainable engineering, showing that you take one of the topics that you're interested in by making it more sustainable. <clears throat> Final presentations, 23rd, 25th and 30th of March. This is important. This is the deadline when we will have to discuss your project presentations. It will be 12 minutes presentation, three, min three to five minutes discussion and questions. Um, so this is quite important that we keep the timeline because of course, um, at 1st of April, the course will be closed and then we, I have to deliver the, the grades. So it's important that we keep those deadlines um, in mind. 7th of April is the last day when you can hand in your final report. Um, we simply have to stick to those deadlines because um, we have to close the course in April and then you will have to get a, a grade for the work you did during the 12 weeks. <clears throat> So this is more or less what um, the structure of the course. I don't see any questions, so I will just continue. Um, I mentioned this already. These are the three courses that I'm teaching at Reykjavik University. Usually I teach a summer school in the summer, which is mostly uh, where, we, where we go, where we discuss sustain, um, renewable energies. Um, we put it in a global context and we go visit out in the field um, different energy uh, power plants, geothermal power plants and hydropower plants. Um, this is usually done during summertime when it's easier to travel around the country. Mm. Um, so, so then I'm gonna go into this next part of the lecture where I'm gonna address um, what sustainable engineering is all about. And to do this, to start this discussion, I would like to you to again, go to menti.com and provide your answer to the question, what is sustainable engineering? Just to see, we will discuss it afterwards, the different questions. So please um, go to menti.com as you did before and type in your answer to the question, what is sustainable engineering? So Yang Shu is already sharing his screen. So feel free um, to go to menti.com Type in 75, 13, 58, 2, and answer the question, what is sustainable engineering? So, do we have some answers? Anyone? Feel free to type in whatever you, um, whatever you think about. It's more just to uh, um, start a discussion, your answers uh, to start a discussion, what is expected? Production with a focus of future availability of raw materials. Yes, we will actually, like I mentioned before, we will look at the availability of 
resources and look into it how long they will be available. So um, we will have one week where we will be specifically fo focusing on the resources. A way to do things more efficiently. Efficiently is a very important aspect of sustainability. Um, uh, in Iceland, there are quite a, a couple of examples where, where the Icelandic um, economy works very efficiently. You know, if you think of geothermal, also in the fishery, there are a lot of ways of reusing the waste streams in the fishery sector. Um, and also the aluminum sector, there are also ways to try to uh, make aluminum production more efficient. Building sustainable engineering systems. Systems is very important because it makes the linkage between, uh, between different aspects. So the nexus between different concepts or different technologies is, in, is also important. So uh, I like the word system. Systems using energy and resources sustainably. Of course, this goes into the same uh, direction. Uh, again, I, I, system analysis is an important part of sustainable engineering, where you just simply look at the interaction between different um, sectors. Engineering with a strong view on environmental, social, financial sustainability. I like this one because this one has environmental, social, and financial. So if you think about sustainability, it has always four pillars. Um, it's the environmental pillar, the social pillar, the economic pillar or the financial pillar. And sometimes some authors argue also that there should be a um, cultural pillar. <clears throat> um, a process that will not ruin the natural environment. I really like this comment because we also have to preserve the natural environment. I mean, if you look at the reports, we have a drastic uh, biodiversity loss. So um, this is a very important um, um, comment. Um, engineering mechanics systems and production made with a carbon neutral neutrality in mind. Carbon neutrality is eminent. Um, if you think about the Paris Agreement, we have about seven years left. If we want, uh, if we want to keep the warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius, at the current CO2 emission rates, we have about seven and a half, seven years left, and then we would reach one and a half degrees Celsius. And the projections regarding um, natural disasters are um, severe if we surpass 1.5 degrees Celsius. So very important point as well, ensuring that future generations can still survive and use resources. Of course, the intergenerational justice is in very important. So, and I fully agree with actually all your comments. So thank you uh, everyone for answering this. I will like to share again my slides and um, go back to the to the lecture. So, of course, if you look look it up in a dictionary, sustainability, then you will find the definition that uh, sounds like this. Sustainable engineering is the process of designing or operating system such that they use energy and resources sustainably. In other words, at a rate that does not compromise the natural environment or the ability for future generations to meet their own needs. So I think what you answered pretty much covers the definition that you would get if you would look it up in a dictionary or in a, in a textbook. Um, so, um, and what I wanna point out that sustainable engineering is usually also um, uh, en engineering that looks at the system where it connects different, um, different sectors and tries to put it in a holistic sustainability context. For example, in textbooks, you would frequently find that sustainable engineering includes water supply. So the first point is also maybe a point why I put so much uh, um, emphasis on, on, on the water resources, food production, housing and shelter, sanitation and waste management, energy development, transportation, industrial processing, development of natural resources, cleaning up polluted waste sites, planning projects to reduce environmental and social impacts, restoring natural environments such as forests, lakes, streams, and wetlands, providing medical care to those in need, minimizing the responsibility, disposing of waste to benefit all, 
improving industrial processes to eliminate waste and reduce consumption, recommending the appropriate and innovative use of technology. So you see, sustainable engineering covers pretty much the entire engineering um, context. I think almost any engineer in the world could somehow relate to sustainable, to sustainable engineering by simply making the topic that they're working on more sustainable. And that is what I would like to address. And not, it's not so much about going into the details of technology because you should have gotten this from your other lectures where, uh, where you focused on a specific technology. Um, but here in this course, really it's all about putting it in context of sustainability and showing how you can make a process more sustainable. <clears throat> Um, frequently, there are other aspects that go more into social science, um, like um, quality education, gender equality, reduced inequalities, decent work, economic growth, finally peace, justice, and strong institutions that are um, also topics that are frequently mentioned in connection to sustainable engineering. <clears throat> um, so. Um, I think we answered more or less the question what sustainable engineering is about. And I would like to show you in the next one and a half hours some of the projects that we are working at Reykjavik, at Reykjavik University in sustainable engineering at Reykjavik University. Um, maybe here, this is just another picture of visualizing sustainability engineering. It's all about decreasing the vulnerability of the system and making it more resilient towards change. So if you have here um, the livelihood on the y-axis or the quality of life of a society, and all of a sudden you have a shock coming like an economic crisis or an environmental crisis, and uh, the society would, um, would have a huge impact, then if you have a sustainable enge uh, um, engineering and a resilient society, you would somehow manage to cope with this impact and readdress the quality of life back up um, faster because if your system is more resilient. Um, a vulnerable society, of course, they would, it would collapse and then it would struggle with bringing up quality of life again. Mm. You might look at the um, different nations that have been hit by the economic crisis in 2008 and you might compare, for example, which nation was able to readdress the, life or the, the quality of life um, um, efficiently and which nations were hit harder and where the society collapsed and, and had really struggled to come back up in a more efficient way. <clears throat> um, of, course, of course, it has various different aspects, vulnerability and resilience, but this is the general, as the general concept of sustainable engineering. Sustainable, sustainable engineering also includes four different phases. <clears throat> The first phase is the exploitation. So that is when you have a throughput economy, you go in, you exploit the resources, you take them out, um, you use them. It could be geothermal resources. It could be, for example, timber in a, in, a, in a forest where you just go in and you cut down the trees. Then you have the second phase where you try to conserve the resources, where you say, okay, you would like to make, you, uh, use the exploitation in a conservative way so that you regenerate. So you only take out the amount of trees that grow back at the same time. This would be kind of a conservation measure. And the release, the release is what you release in terms of emissions, in terms of waste, um, uh, is, is the third phase of, um, that could be identified within sustainable engineering. And then the last phase, the, the last phase in order to make it circular would be the restoration. So this would be, um, if you restore the areas that you have been using for exploitation, if in the case of a, of a, of a timber production, um, you would restore the original um, forest by doing reforestation, by trying to get back the original um, flora and fauna that you, had, that you had in the area before it. And if you manage to close the cycle then you get into something that becomes circular and then you could go towards something that uh, that adheres to a circular economy where resources are being used in a circular way. <clears throat> um, 
So this is just to give an overview of where sustainable engineering can um, be useful. In principle, it can be useful in all four cases, um, in all four phases of, of, of the use of resources. And um, so it's really a very wide um, um, topic that can relate to many different areas. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Could you please ex explain the release phase um, a bit more because I can't really think of anything maybe with the example timber production. Um, where's the release there? Okay, so if you have the release phase, um, usually release phase refers to the emissions. So if you were to use, um, um, so in the timber case, it might be a bit difficult to come up with something, but if you were to use, um, for, for example, pellets, and you have the CO2 emissions from burning the biomass, you would have some emissions going into the, into the atmosphere. So um, in this case, it would not really be restoration, but you could have um, carbon assimilation by reforesting, and then the CO2 would be um, reassimilated. I'm not sure if this would be a release, but a, an, I mean, a release is definitely something where you emit emissions into the environment and you want to um, minimize the release phase to a minimum so that um, in terms of water pollution and in terms of um, air pollution and also in terms of, um, um, yeah, I, I, I guess the, the, most, the most evident ones are uh, water pollution and air pollution where you can directly relate to a release phase where you release unwanted waste streams into the environment. Um, we'll get back to it, back to this aspects later on in the lecture when we discuss the, the, um, the priorities of treating waste, um, where of course the release would be the last step. So you would of course try to reuse it, recycle it, um, um, or um, put it in landfill, store it so that it becomes inert and it doesn't harm the environment. Um, release would really be the last um, um, option for releasing waste into the stream. But we'll discuss this further when we get to the, um, to the treatment of waste streams. All right. Does this answer Thank you very your much. question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, I also show this picture also because it kind of addresses sustainability in a very um, um, holistic point of view. So you have here on the y-axis the ecological footprint uh, per person, of course, of different countries. And on the x-axis, you have the livelihood. All countries and all societies strive towards a livelihood that is higher, which is here expressed through the Human Development Index. Obviously, everybody wants to have a, um, uh, um, um, an affluent lifestyle where you can afford te um, um, technologies and goods and you have a big house and you, uh, and you wouldn't like to have a, a high standard of living. So uh, all countries strive towards a livelihood that is usually what you say 0 0.8 um, is higher. So the index of the human development index is composed out of different um, aspects like education, like healthcare, like um, wealth, of course. Um, unfortunately, there's a correlation between human development index and ecological footprint. Um, in the first world or in the Western world, in Europe and North America, the, uh, where, where countries are rather rich, we also, this is also say associated with a higher ecological footprint. <clears throat> And the point I would like to make in regard to this figure is that it's possible through sustainable engineering, like for the example for Australia, which went from, if you look at the time scale here, down here you have 1975 was the diamond symbol and the round symbol is 2003, where Australia actually improved the livelihood while decreasing the ecological footprint. And this is kind of what I think is the main objective of sustainable engineering. Obviously you can go into and discuss the details of the human development index and also of the ecological footprint, how it's calculated 
and what concepts it includes. Um, but in general, for the whole world, um, I think this represents pretty much the challenge we're facing in sustainable engineering um, and the challenges we should address when we think of making our project more sustainable. Mm. You also have here um, these, um, these footprint maps that you can find for different aspects where you have the area that corresponds to the footprint. And you can see that, for example, the African nations have a very low footprint. And, the, and, and if you uh, scale the size of the country towards the footprint, then you have um, the, the European countries or the North American countries that take up a lot more space than, um, than other countries. <clears throat> um so um yeah any further questions otherwise just please feel free to do it the more interactive we are the more i can address your question and it's all about um you know addressing the the, the, the questions and having an interesting discussion um within the course so i want to point this out iceland um even though iceland has almost a hundred percent renewable energy electricity production um the livelihood is very high with over 0 0.93, I think, I believe it, if I, if I, when I looked it up last time. But this is associate with a, associated with a pretty high ecological footprint of over six um, hectares per, per, global hectares per person. Mm. So, which is, of course, uh, um, um, unsustainable. What I want to point out is here, um, this world average biocapacity available per person. So this is what the Ecological Footprint Society identified as the threshold of where we, um, we um, surpass the sustainability of what the world can regenerate at, uh, as resources. So everything above this line here is actually using more resources than are available um, um, according to the biocapacity um, worldwide. <clears throat> um, obviously, this is without taking into account that you still need to leave some resources available for um, the wilderness. So if you want to have, if you want to preserve parts of the world also as wilderness, then according to this Ecological Footprint Society, you would need to be below one um, that then to, to also preserve some of the um, um, wilderness in the area. So it would be even more tricky to reduce the ecological footprint um, further down. Um, yeah, so um, I'm just gonna continue. So um, next week we will go into the, the, the status quo of the world and why we're facing, um, or, or why we're facing this uh, environmental crisis that some uh, authors are postulating, but as a result of these result of these uh, studies that have been coming up in recent years, the United Nations has developed the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, those are 17 goals. You have here the link again, 17 aspirational goals um, uh, with 193 member states that have signed up to um, adhere to those United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And if you look into it, many of those um, goals actually adhere to sustainable or are linked to sustainable engineering. And I would like actually the definition of the uh, sustainable, sustainable development goals um, as a way of showing that your project, your sustainability project adheres to one of those 17 goals. Um, in your presentation of your project, I would like you to think while you're working on your project, to what development goals does your project link to? In this way, you just make it more um, convincing that if you can say that, for example, um, 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 affordable clean energy, if you're working on a project that produces renewable energies, you could state that it adheres to the sustainable development goal number seven, affordable and clean energy, by pointing out how it addresses exactly this specific um, uh, sustainability goal. Um, it's always good to use 
targets and objectives that are um, published. Uh, of course, the, you might have a project that goes more into detail and you might also say that these 17 aspirational uh, global goals do not adhere adequately for total sustainability, but it's a good first start to, to start, it's a good first start to discuss sustainability of, of projects by simply looking in, into how they adhere to those um, sustainable development goals. Um, so this is, so I'm teaching this course since 2015. And one particular thing I like actually to do with the students is to put the project, if the project uh, fits to it, to look into by how, how much are the costs for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and what is the potential of saving greenhouse gas emissions. So these are different student projects in the last um, five years or five years from the course where students have been looking at electric trains. So these are all Icelandic projects. They have been looking at methane cars, um, biogas. So this is biogas cars in Iceland. And they have been looking at biofuel cars where you add in 15% of, of uh, biofuels to the gasoline. And then you they have been looking at um, hydrogen cars, electric cars, um, electricity for, for ships and um, bicycles, local tomatoes, trolley buses are down here. And what we did in an exercise to compare the different projects is to look at the costs that are associated with saving greenhouse gas emissions and the potential of the different concepts by looking at the time scale between 2015 and 2030, <clears throat> and then mapping it out into in, in, one, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a figure like this. And then we can see that, for example, building an electric train in Iceland would be quite expensive, simply because you don't have yet train infrastructure in Iceland, and the, the cost for it would be um, pretty high, while the CO2 savings, if you were to build a train between Keflavik and Reykjavik um, might be, um, I think this was the, the, the airport train that the, a group of students looked at, um, that it's comparable by promoting the biogas cars in Iceland, where you have the biogas that is produced from a landfill, where you use organic waste to produce methane, and then you have carbon neutral, almost uh, uh, carbon neutral uh, fuel. Um, and of course, there you could have almost the same amount of CO2 savings with a lot lower cost. <clears throat> and what I point out, of course, bicycles, building bicycle lanes um, are actually cheaper because people, if people use bicycles, um, it's healthy, people get more healthier, um, it produces less emissions, um, and you could actually save money simply by trying to convince people to go by to ride bicycles and um, and you could also save a similar amount of CO2 by trying to convert, uh, convince people using bicycles. Trolley buses seem to be, according, at least according to this study that the group of students did, seem to have also a negative cost. So that means that you actually save money by um, promoting trolley buses and you can also save CO2 emissions. I'm gonna come back to those projects later on in the lecture when I go into the details of uh, some of the um, carbon, low carbon energy uh, projects. Um, yeah, hydrogen cars um, have a huge potential of saving CO2, but it's also, it's also a bit more cost, cost intensive than electric cars, simply because for electric cars, you already have the infrastructure to provide electricity to um, the consumer and the um, car owners. So um, I think what's important regarding sustainable engineering to have a project partners. Um, and at least in my group, we had always um, a good collaboration with, um, with the um, Fishery Institute, Freshwater and Fishery Institute of Iceland. Um, now it's the Marine um, Institute looking at um, um, marine um, quality. We had collaborations with uh, Iceland, the Icelandic Med Office, and ISAVIA, the Icelandic 
aviation provider. I'm going to come back to those projects later on in the lectures. We also work together with the Soil Conservation, uh, the Soilheimer, Soilheimer is an eco village in Iceland, about two hours drive close to Flúðir, and it's a small village where um, 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 a, a lady tried to build up a, um, a small village that lives as sustainable as possible by having their own geothermal power plant, by producing their own vegetables, and um, so we looked into the sustainability of this eco village as well. The Soil Conservation Service um, is the governmental agency that tries to restore the vegetation of Iceland. I will be going into this as well and more in detail um, later on in the lecture. But in principle, as you might know, about a, 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 a quarter or 40% of Iceland was covered by forests before the first settlers arrived. Um, most of the forests have been cut down for grazing or for, for wood use. And, um, and now Iceland puts a lot of effort, especially in recent years, uh, into reforesting and restoring the, the, the land, uh, re restoring the original vegetation. And this is also a, um, a very good partner to look into sustainable engineering projects. <clears throat> um, other potential partners is Sorpa. Sorpa is the waste company from Reykjavik, from Reykjavik City. Um, and um, their collaboration could be very important because um, they produce biomass from the organic waste and we could optimize this um, biomass production, biogas production. And um, obviously if, it, if biogas is produced from waste, then it's a carbon neutral energy source that can be used in cars and could be a very interesting um, carbon neutral energy source. The Environmental Agency of Iceland, there we have been working together on the Water Framework Directive, trying to quantify the ecological status of rivers. Then the Planning Agency is the agency that, um, that um, gives an evaluation of environmental impact statements. Um, it's also it could be a very interesting partner. And then of course, the power companies, Landsverking, um, and Orkenstoffen could be also um, um, project partners to team up and to look into sustainable engineering. I want to point out that we have several international um, um, collaborations also with other universities. For example, in Austria, uh, the Klagenfurt University, in Switzerland, the um, Hochschule für Technik Rapperswil. Um, and then we have a, we had a collaboration with the Metropolitan University in Tokyo, and um, and then also the Him Himalayan University Consortium in Himalaya, where we have a, a collaboration of two PhD projects that are ongoing. Um, the interesting thing about the collaboration with Himalaya is that we can look at hydrological processes in Iceland, where we have the biggest glaciers and very intense precipitation and then take the concept of predicting flow in rivers and estimating water resources in Iceland and take it to an area like, for example, Nepal um, in the Himalayans where um, energy production is still based on a lot on fossil fuels and where maybe it's possible to have sustainable um, hydropower, of course, taking into account the pristine nature um, up there and, and shift some of the um, fossil-based energy production towards something that is more renewable. And as I mentioned at the beginning, with the Energy Institute in Linz, in Austria, we have a very a close collaboration since, um, since the 1st of January of this year. Um, so I would like to make a short break, a five minute break. So uh, let's be back at um, half past, what is it now in Iceland? I think it should be uh, 11. So half past 11 um, um, in eight minutes, just to get a short break. And then I go into some of the research projects that we are, are ongoing, that we have ongoing at Reykjavik University. And if you're interested, of course, we can think about um, collaboration with research topics. And it's of course also to inspire you. So please be back in eight minutes at 
11.30 so that we can continue with the lecture um, at 11.30. If you have any questions um, during the break, we can also discuss it. You can write it into the chat and we can discuss it also then. So let's meet in eight minutes. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone, back from the short break. Um, I'm gonna share again my slides. Um, here it is. And then put them up as full screen. Okay, so this second part of the lecture <clears throat> is all about water resources and Water resources um, includes many different aspects because there's always a nexus between water resources, energy production, production, um, food production, and the environment. Water is essential for life, living in the world. And so that is why I put a lot of emphasis on water resources. And <clears throat> in particular here in Iceland, um, waters, in Iceland, of course, water is available in abundance. Um, Iceland, as you probably all know, um, is about 100,000 square kilometer large. It has maybe 200, 350,000 people. I don't know the exact numbers for 2021. Might be 360,000 people. And three quarters of the island are semi-natural areas. It's in principle the entire highlands that where no one lives and that are uninhabited. Mm -hmm. um, about 7% of the island is, is, are still wetlands and about 2.4% are um, agricultural areas. Like I mentioned before, most of the forests have been cut down and clear cut and only about 1%, maybe it has increased in recent years um, to a little bit more than 1%, but large parts of the forest have been cut down and are currently being restored. <clears throat> But the interesting part regarding uh, water resources are that you have about 11% of the island that are covered by glaciers. So Vatnajökull is the biggest glacier in Europe and you simply have a tremendous amount of water that is stored in form of ice um, in, in the highlands on the ice caps. And um, also another interesting part is that you have extreme precipitation because you have from, from the southwest um, warm, humid air coming with the Gulf Stream, and that meets then the cold Arctic airs coming from the from the Arctic, from the North Pole, and then you have a lot of precipitation. So you can have up to 20,000 millimeters precipitation, especially here in the southern part, um, where uh, where you have the highest point, Juanatelos um, Nukur, and just uh, on the southern tongue of Vatnajökull. Um, so when the air, when the warm, humid air comes towards Iceland, meets the Arctic air, and then also goes into higher altitudes and is being pushed up into higher altitudes, then you have a lot of precipitation. So there's really a lot of water available in, in Iceland, making it very interesting to investigate water resources. <clears throat> um, yeah, and the, um, also the natural status and the natural environment in the highlands are also a very good place where you can still investigate hydrological processes as they occur in nature without being influenced by, by hydropower structures or anthropogenic channelized uh, um, rivers. So it's really a, a, um, a, a beautiful case study for hydrologists to look into. Um, for Iceland is frequently called the land of fire and ice and this was probably most significantly expressed during the 2014 eruption of Barrambunga. It was the last eruption when, um, um, when that occurred in Iceland when over six months a lava, new lava flow field occurred, Holohrein it's called. And it's, it has about the, the, the size of um, Manhattan Island being about 84 square kilometer large. And you can see it even here in that satellite picture um, so this was during six months, during the winter of 2014-2015, an eruption going on during six, six months almost, when um, 
the, um, when simply lava was spitting out of one of the um, craters below what now you're called. And I want to address this, why this is so important for hydrological resources. So here you have a close up picture where you can see the lava coming out of the, um, um, of the side of, of what now you call. And if the eruption would have been underneath the glacier, then there would have been a tremendous amount of water being melting ex extremely fast. And this could have led to a huge flooding where estimates according to hydrological um, simulations estimate that in, for example, at Detifoss, one of the big waterfalls in Northern Iceland, the, the, the flow would have increased to 10 to 20 times the natural flow. <clears throat> and it's actually one of those aspects where you have really um, significant, a, a very high dynamic in the water flow and where hydrologists can look into it and uh, look, uh, well, where hydrologists can investigate um, hydrological processes. So the point I want to make is that Iceland is really an excellent case study to test hydrological modeling and to come up with ways of managing water resources um, by simply looking at the natural processes. Another important factor that influences the dynamic of flows in Iceland are those glacial lake outbursts or um, um, uh, um, uh, I forgot the Icelandic word for it. Um, um, yeah, so glacial lake outbursts, I, I'm sorry, I forgot the Icelandic word, but glacial lake outbursts is when, when water is being stored in the glacier until it simply becomes too much that it cannot be contained anymore in the glacier and it breaks open. And then you have what you, have, what you call a glacial lake, glacial lake outburst and here you have the example, I think this was before 1987, I don't remember the exact year, but when one of those glacial lake outbursts occur, occurred and you can see this bridge still in southern Iceland, it's the longest bridge in Iceland, it's about 900 meter long. If you drive along the ring road, you drive over a bridge that has been reconstructed in the area, <clears throat> but which is a lot shorter. And this simply shows that the dynamic of water can so be so powerful that it's not possible to contain it or to build dams and try to limit the spread of the water with engineering, conventional engineering solutions. And the reason why I point this out, because this is so extremely important for other areas of the world, thinking of Bangladesh, thinking of um, um, Central Asia um, or other areas in the world, because as climate change becomes more intense, we will have more intense um, precipitation events and we will have more intense flooding events. And, and, and there's probably no other place in the world where you still have natural systems um, where you can investigate huge hydrological dynamics and see how nature reacts to it. <clears throat> So the main point I wanna make with this picture is that in Iceland, you have a very dynamic hydrological system where eruption underneath glaciers or um, glacial lake outburst, uh, I think they're called in Icelandic, now it came back to my memory. I'm sorry for the Iceland, Icelandic pro pronunciation, but uh, these lead to these facts where you have um, extreme floodings with over 20 to 50 to 100 times more water flow than under normal conditions. Usually when you drive through this area, this river is a small river uh, just flowing beneath, beneath the, the, the bridge. And if you even if you go over the new bridge that has been built in that area, you would think, why did they build such a wide bridge? And it's simply because from time to time, you can have a glacial lake outburst that simply increases the flow to something that you cannot contain with um, engineering structures because it's nature can be simply more powerful than, uh, than engineering structures. <clears throat> the second point, the second thing I want to point out with this picture is that nature changes. As glacier retreat, the flow of rivers can 
alter their flow and they can flow into a different valley. And this also happened in this area here where a skater out um, what changed the direction and it doesn't flow through this river anymore. So the glacial lake outbursts don't flow this valley anymore and they flow in an adjacent valley. So the, the, the building of the bridge has become obsolete simply because the glacial lake outbursts don't flow through this area anymore. And I wanna go into it why this is so important for sustainable engineering or for environmental engineering to um, investigate those aspects because as our research shows, we can anticipate such changes. And by anticipating it, we can adapt the infrastructure also and make it um, um, more, more sustainable. I have here a short video that I, would, um, that I can show you. I'm gonna try to run this. It's about two minutes long. I hope you can see this. I have to switch over again and share the other, no. It has to be there, this one. And so the reason I'm showing this video Our is next just, experiment embraces one of the most dangerous. Show what happens if lava meets on ice and then to address it in the Icelandic context, what does it mean for hydrology in Iceland? Forces of nature. Almost 4 million people have watched red-hot lava meet ice. We caught up with artist Bobby Saki and geologist Jeff Carson and their rumbling lava furnace to ask them what they thought would happen. I had no idea what it was going to do. No idea at all. The first guess is always it's going to explode. Blow. Always number one. Or it's going to tunnel down. It's just going to dig right through the ice, melt a hole in the ice. And of course, it didn't do any of those things. I was stunned by what it did when it hit the ice. And you see the bubbles, you know, bubbles this big, and then there's bubbles within bubbles. The scrambled eggs from hell uh, is the way it looks in that video. It just did things we just didn't really expect. So why are volcanic bubbles formed? The lava is so hot that when it's poured onto the ice, the ice instantly turns not just into water, but straight into steam. Now, this steam has to escape, so it bubbles through the lava. So while it looks like the lava itself is boiling, it's actually the steam being produced that is trying to escape. As the lava cools, we start to get a thick black layer forming on top, and this starts to trap those bubbles of superheated steam inside the rock, and it's kind of like a natural form of glass blowing. But how does the lava crawl across the ice? Shouldn't it melt right through? The formation of all of this steam helps the lava to flow because it means that it's sitting on top of a blanket of steam rather than in contact with the ice itself. And this means the friction between the lava and the ice surface is very low. OK, so um, I just wanted to show this very... Um, um, one second, I just want to share my slides before I continue talking. Okay, so, so I wanted to show this video because in Iceland, exactly what, what, the, what the, the people in the video showed on small scale, you actually have it in large scale in Iceland. And this is a picture of Hraunarfossar uh, next to next in Borgafjordr in Western Iceland. So it's about um, two hours drive from Reykjavik if you go to Borgarnes and then you would follow Hraunarfossar. And in that area, you can see a water um, fall coming out of a lava field with almost 200 cubic meters per second of water simply coming out of the inside of the earth. And the reason why I linked this to the video is because this actually happened um, within uh, when, when, when lava meets ice and it forms bubbles within the lava field, you can create these cavities within the lava field where water can flow through. So at the surface, you don't see anything anymore but the water infiltrates into the lava field and huge rivers can be formed within the lava field and come out um, 
uh, downstream. And obviously, if you want to um, store the water or use it for irrigation or for hydropower, then if you were to build a, a reservoir upstream and the water simply infiltrates into the lava field and comes out later, further down, it's not possible to build a hydropower a, a plant or to store the water or use the water in the area. So it's an interesting um, hydrological process where water infiltrates and comes down. You have very similar um, examples in the European Alps, almost everywhere where you just have karstic systems. So it's not lava fields, but, but karsts where water infiltrates into the um, underground and comes out further down. And I wanna show um, this, how we assessed and how we anticipated the hydrological connectivity within one project um, on a glacier in Switzerland, where we simply made dye experiments or tracer experiments where we colored the meltwater on a glacier with um, eosine, diosine, and what was the third color? I forgot the third color. But the, 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 the idea is that we use this um, um, biological degradable um, color. Um, and in order to assess how does the water flow from the glacier through a karst system and where does it come out? And the main point I wanna make with this without going into detail is that um, by, um, by identifying how the water flows through the underground, um, you can see how you can anticipate how the water fl flow will be in the future. And as I showed before with the picture of the bridge over uh, the longest bridge of Iceland that goes now over a small stream by doing research, you could anticipate it. What does it mean if the glacier becomes slower? In the, in the example here of the paper that we published in 2013, um, we anticipated the, the climate change impacts on the glacier and the water flow on a glacier in Switzerland by simply looking, making tracer experiments and looking how does the water flow. So you have on the top picture here, the situation today where the glacier is still quite large over 200 meters thickness and the glacier fills up during summertime with water. So the glacier is almost floating in the water and the water flows towards the north and comes down into the Simmental, which is in the Northern part of the glacier. While in the future, what we project up until the year, year 2050 about roughly, the ice mass will decrease. And accordingly, the glacier will not float in the water anymore. So the connectivity towards the north will be, will be blocked. And then you will have water not flowing through the northern area anymore, but infiltrating into the karst system and coming out through the karst sources. And the reason why I show this example, it's, it's one way where we can do hydrological modeling and anticipate climate change impacts to anticipate where water scarcity will appear in the future due to climate change and other areas where water availability will still be available in um, due because of because there will still be snow melt and um, ice melt in the future as well. Obviously, if you have snow melt here during spring, all this snow melt will infiltrate into the karst system and then flow towards the karst sources and come out there. So if you're more interested in this, of course, I can. Uh, th there's a full publication about this, th this study in here. But the point I want to make is that tracer experiments can be extremely interest important in order to address the hydrological connectivity and see how the source of the water resources are connected with um, downstream um, um, uh, um, water, water um, needs. So here, just to visualize this, so today with the full glacier, most of the water would flow towards the northern part because the water flows through the glacier towards the northern part. And what we project for future climate scenarios, that in the future, if the glacier decreases, most of the water will infiltrate into the karst system and come out at lower karst sources um, in downstream areas. <clears throat> Another important point why hydrological um, modeling is important is obviously because those, uh, like I mentioned before, those um, glacial ice caps 
are, could be, are an important water source. And since they're at the highest elevation, this is, these are really important resources that can be used for electricity production. As I mentioned before, about 70 to 80% of the electricity in Iceland comes from hydropower. This always depends on the year. If you have a lot of snow and a lot of precipitation, you could have a higher share of hydropower. And in other uh, years when you have less snow and or less precipitation, you might have a, a year with less uh, um, hydropower production. Mm. But here again, the, the share of, of the electricity production in Iceland, so about three quarters or, or maybe 70% is hydropower, the rest is renewable, and there's a still a little bit of fossil um, energy. So I think this was from 2012. Uh, um, um, I can't see the number because it's covered by the Zoom um, meeting invite, but, um, but the, the, the numbers didn't change drastically. In general, the energy production is dominated by hydropower in Iceland. But hydrological modeling is important because you could assess, um, for example, for Thrandar Jökull, you could go in and use hydrological models to estimate how much water is melting from an ice cap like this and how much energy can be produced um, with, uh, with the water that is melting um, on an ice cap like this, which is roughly um, 1,000, I think about 1,600 meters high or 1,000 meters high. Mm. So we did, we did this by uh, simply using, so here's Thrandar Jökull, the picture you saw before of, of, this, of this ice cap here. Um, um, we used um, two hydrological stations where we have runoff information over the last 30 years to calibrate our hydrological models. And then we simulated with hydrological models how much water flows down the streams by simply collecting it, all the small um, runoff streams and putting it hypothetically in a reservoir up here and then turbinating the water down towards a um, hydropower um, plant at the shoreline and releasing it to the ocean and estimate what would be the power potential of such an infrastructure. Again, this is purely a scientific um, a water management exercise. It doesn't mean that we would like to develop this. And of course, part of this area is in a nature reserve. It's a, it's, this is, of course, a political and also social discussion if it's worthwhile to develop it. But using hydrological models, you could at least estimate what is the potential, how much water is available, and then you can start a discussion on um, what is worthwhile of using for hydropower and what not. <clears throat> So I want to cut this short um, we'll, because we will have one week where we'll, we'll be focusing on, on hydrological modeling um, during the next 12 weeks. But these are the results. So you can use hydrological models by estimating the total flow in a river, estimating how much comes from the rain, how much comes from the snow melt, and how much comes from the ice cap. And these are really important um, estimations because if you know that only a large small part comes from the ice cap and you know that climate change projection predict that the glaciers will disappear within the next um, um, decades, you can still say if it makes sense or if water resources will be available. In this particular case, we know that the contribution from the ice melt is minimal because most of the water is still snow melt and precipitation. So water availability in that specific area will still be available in the future also when the ice caps will have melted and will have gone. Of course, this is always case specific in a larger area like for Vatna Yakul, the ice contribution is a lot bigger because it's a large bigger glacier. And then and that's why you would have to do the simulations for each specific case in particular. Mm. But for water managers and hydropower managers, these results are extremely important also because it shows why the snow melt is so important. As, as shown, for example, here, the contribution from the snow melt is a significant part of the total runoff and dominates it. And this brings me to the, what I mentioned at the very beginning, the field day why we put an emphasis on doing snow hydrology for a whole day. 
um, simply because snow melt in the Arctic and also in the high Alps and um, in the Himalayans and in elevated areas, snow melt is simply an extremely important contributor to um, water resources. Um, and snow and rain will still be available even if the temperatures get warmer because the glaciers will disappear if, if, uh, if, if temperatures get warmer because of the retreat of the ice masses. But precipitation and snow melt in some scenarios will even increase simply because you will have more evaporation through, due to warmer temperatures. And then you will also have more precipitation um, in downstream areas. <clears throat> Please, if something is not clear, please ask questions. It's easier for me to address direct questions than simply um, talking about the results um, without having um, questions. So obviously, once you have assimilations like this and you know how much water is available from a, from a, from a ice cap like this, you can of course then estimate through classical engineering, what is the energy potential and you can even as assess how much energy will be available um, through, uh, through the different seasons of the year, as shown here in, in megawatt hours per year. Also, what this shows clearly that hydropower is very seasonal, very seasonal dependent. Obviously, the snow and ice only melts during the summer month when the temperatures are above zero degrees, and then most of the water will be available. So typically, if you don't have a storage capacity or storage unit, you will only have energy production during the June, June July, August, uh, or very intense energy production during June, July, August. So that is why the storage capacities um, are important in order to balance out the electricity production over the year. <clears throat> um, yeah, so, so my point is hydrological modeling is important because it directly relates to um, energy production, but of course in other areas also to irrigation and other water usages, usages. So once you have a hydrological model that works for one catchment, you can very easily transpose it to other areas, use data from other areas and look into various different options and then assess the energy potential from various different um, areas. Again, I want to point out and I want to emphasize this. So these are these were projects we did for Orkenstofnen, where we simply estimated the energy potential of different areas in Iceland to look at the hydro, hydropower potential. That does not mean that this will be ever developed. And it's again, a political and also a social discussion if areas like this should be ever used for hydro, energy production. But at least through the modeling, you can assess what is possible and assess the potential of uh, energy production to provide the political and the um, social discourse um, information of what is possible. <clears throat> so here's just another um, idea. Typically, if we start a, a hydrological modeling, we go in and we discuss where can we set up gauging stations where we measure the discharge, where should we have precipitation stations, um, and then we try to get the information that we need for the hydrological modeling um, for a specific area um, in order to assess um, the amount of water in, um, in, the, in the catchment. Mm -hmm. There's an ongoing project including all the Scandinavian countries. Um, it's called Nordic Snow Network where Reykjavik University is included and there we discuss and, in, um, and we compare um, snow hydrology models, snow melt models, um, um, and we are contributing to this um, project with, with our research from Iceland and compare it with our Finnish partners and other Scandinavian partners. So if you're interested in this, uh, you might take a look at this snownetfmi.if um, uh, um, website where there is more information about um, snow hydrology. <clears throat> I also want to point out this publication we had. Um, it's actually based on the field days we had from previous years, where we looked at the snow depth and the snow density um, in different areas. And this is what we would, what we did during the last years, in during the field day, where we simply went out 
with a group of students, we measured the snow depth, we measured the snow density, and we estimated what is the snow water equivalent in the snow pack um, for, uh, in different areas. And of course, then we had to assess the uncertainty. If you measure, if you spend one day measuring snow depth and snow density, you will see that there's quite a, a, a large uncertainty in the measurements simply because if you measure it at one location and, the, and then you measure it one meter further, the result might differ. And this is what I would like to address during the field day, simply by looking at if you go out into the field and do the measurements, what is the accuracy and the, and the um, uncertainty of measurements and how precise can you predict the snow melt in the field in, for, the, for the upcoming spring? So if you're interested in this, this has all already been uh, published. Um, I think it should also be in the, in the Dropbox. Um, so feel free to contact me if you would like to have more information about this. There's also a special issue about monitoring uh, of the seasonal snow cover um, where different authors from around the world have been working on similar aspects um, regarding snow hydrology. <clears throat> okay, um, yeah. Of course, during summertime, snow, the snow has gone. So we're also looking at land management and water resources. So this goes into the nexus between land management, water resources, food production, energy production, and the environment, um, which is in principle a key, in my opinion, a key challenge that we have to address in regard to climate change, simply because there's a strong nexus between the different sectors. We have a case study in Iceland located close to Eyjafjallajökull in southern Iceland, close to the um, Rangarvetlir, which is a municipality in southern Iceland. And this, and the reason why we chose the case study in southern Iceland is because in Rangarvetlir is also Mount Hekla. Mount Hekla is the most active volcano in Iceland, which erupts roughly every 50 years. So the magmatic pressure is again increasing. Vegestofen is always uh, giving out warnings again that uh, Mount Hecla might erupt very soon. And you probably all remember Eyjafjallajökull, which erupted in 2000, uh, I think it was 2010. Um, and then um, this blocked the aviation traffic across Europe and blocked Heathrow. Heathrow was blocked for two weeks because of the ash that was being transported across the European continent from Eyjafjallajökull eruption. But we chose this, this, um, this case study in Southern Iceland to look into um, the interaction between land management, water resources, um, and also um, natural impacts from eruptions on the water resources. Mm. And these are the two rivers we're looking at, Itri Rangau and Estri Rangau. Um, you have here Gunnarsholt. Gunnarsholt is the headquarters of the Soil Conservation Service. You have also a small lava stream, Hroers Laker, which has a source coming out of the lava field. And, we and the first thing we did here, we investi investigated the hydrological connectivity. Most of the melt and most of the precipitation happens here, um, where the, uh, the higher mountains are and where the ice cap is, simply because the, the humid air um, is blown across the plain here. It, it reaches the mountain, it goes up into higher areas, it gets colder, precipitation starts. So you have most of the precipitation that is happening here. What we found out is that most of the water goes through the lava field and goes over into Itri Rangau. So you have more runoff in Itri Rangau and less precipitation in the catchment of Itri Rangau. While in Estri Rangau, you have more precipitation, more ice melt, but less runoff in the downstream river, which was up to the, up to the, the, the point when we, did, when we simulated this area, actually an unsolved mystery, because of course there were, uh, we had the assumption that some part of the water flows through the lava field, but it has never been quantified before we started this um, investigation. <clears throat> so again, hydrological connectivity is very important in order to address water management. Um, so here a picture of Mount Hecla. Um, here are the eruptions of Mount Hecla that can impact on the water, um, uh, water resources. And this 
brings me to land management. Um, here you have a picture of Rangar Vetiak, um, which is, if you drive now towards Hatla uh, or to, to Gunnarsholt, you will see very pristine green areas. You have in the back here, Mount Hekla, the, the, the volcano that erupted quite frequently. And you will think it's a pretty, pretty uh, nice area to live in, but unfortunately, it was not always as comfortable to live close to a Gunnarsholt. Gunnarsholt is the headquarters of the Soil Conservation Service. You here, have here aerial pictures where you can see a um, forested area. You can see very green and very fertile soils, but it has not always been as fertile as on this picture because only 50 to 60 years ago, the, the area looked like this at the beginning, or maybe this was at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, Gunnarsholt was a farmstead and in principle, the entire area was barren land without any uh, vegetation. And this brings me to the land management issue. Um, the reason why this area has been degraded so much simply because the forest has been cut down and the resilience of the system has been lost. This area shows the farmstead around Gunnarsholt where um, sheep grazing and, and farming has been ongoing. And just a few kilometers upstream, they had an area that was fenced off because this is the source of Hroer's Laker. And this source has been protected over the years because it's a drinking water resource for the summer houses. And you can see the nature that has been striving if you were to protect the area. Um, and, and this is actually what you could expect from natural vegetation in Iceland if, it, if the land was not touched and no one would have been grazing it or cutting down the forest. So you can see here a pretty dense forest and the, the, the joke that is frequently said, what you should do if you get lost in, a, in an Icelandic forest, you should simply stand up. Um, you, you, would, you could very easily get lost, even if this is a very small area, um, but you could very easily get lost in this very dense uh, vegetation area because actually it's volcanic um, um, underground with a lot of phosphorus. So it's a very fertile soil and so once you establish the, the, the vegetation, it becomes resilient also towards volcanic eruptions and the nature can sustain itself. And um, even though you've had in this area just as well a volcanic eruptions and sandstorms and harsh winters as well. So this is the source of Hroer's Laker next to Gunnarsholt. Um, and um, if you look at the upstream of um, Itri Rangau, um, you can see that most of the area actually is still barren and uh, so still has not has still not been vegetated but there are huge forestation projects ongoing in the area where the government and the soil conservation together with the soil conservation service um, is reforesting the area there are plans to um, to have um, substantial parts of Iceland reforested again and um, also because it's a carbon sink if you have forests, you can uh, assimilate CO2, and um, this would, could you could um, argue that this goes into the carbon budgeting of the of the country. Mm -hmm. In our research project in Rangor Vetli, we're investigating how does the vegetation affect the runoff in the river. If you build up the forest here, how will this affect the water quality and the dynamics of the runoff? And this can be important for so many different aspects, ranging from agriculture to, um, to um, energy production, also to drinking water, because in Mount Hat Mount, in the municipality or in the um, town Hetla, drinking water is taken from the groundwater. And during dry periods, the groundwater simply drops, and then it becomes more energy intensive to pump up water. So, um, so the if you find out what happens if you reforest the area to the underground and to the water dynamics, you could also anticipate what this means for um, drinking water resources in downstream areas. <clears throat> and the, the theory behind it is that if you have forests, the forests build up a humus layer in the, on the soil, the soil can store more water, water becomes more available during droughts, um, and also the flood risk is reduced because the water, the, the soil acts like a swamp and um, takes up the water from, from the precipitation and reduces the flood risk. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, so, so here we have a student um, investigating the ecological status of the river. Also what you have, if you build up the forests, you reduce the erosion. And this can be interesting for, for example, here you have the harbor that, um, of, the, of the ferry ship that goes to the Westman Islands where a lot of sediments are being spilled into the harbor. And if you were to reduce the erosion from, from the areas you could build up the forestation and reduce um, erosion rates in rivers downstream. <clears throat> we always put this in a social eco uh, ecological system where we look into anthropogenic impacts, natural impacts, and then try to address the concept of restoring forests in the area from a holistic point of view, and which is which is um, given, which is addressed with this figure here. So, if you're interested in this, there's a there's a web page where we um, have put together all the uh, um, data that have been collected, rangarvetlirru.is, um, and you can see what um, projects have been ongoing in in that area. <clears throat> I'm going to continue right away. I see that time is running. Ecology of rivers. So this is a project close to the capital area, Etlidau River, that we have ongoing. So Etlidau River is um, the beautiful salmon stream flowing from Etlidau Vatten, which is the lake just outside the city boundaries, and um, then flows thr through Etlidau Taler. It's one of the only salmon streams worldwide that flows through a capital area, I believe. And if you look at the um, um, map of it. So you have Blaufjotl, the, the big mountains where the skiing resort is just out of, outside Reykjavik, where most of the pre precipitation happens. Um, the meltwater from the Blue Mountains flows down through Holmsa, Suderau into Etlidar Vatten and then through Etlidar Taler. And what we, we, what we have been investigating here is the spreading of Titimo. And Ditimo is actually an um, in invasive species that has been spreading into Etlidaur. Um, um, so it looks like this. These are pictures from Canada. And of course, if you have a proliferation of algae packages, uh, of algae in, in a river like this, then this is, can be uh, jeopardizing this, the, the reproduction of salmon species in the river. Mm. So I'm not going to go too much into detail, but this is another international project where we've been collaborating actually with Bulgaria, where a similar um, situation occurred in the Bulgarian mountains. Um, six different lakes have we have uh, investigated. And actually what we had, our hypothesis is that there's a link between, um, of course there's a, so these are the anthropogenic pressure, there's an increase of population and uh, there's an increase of number of tourists in Iceland. So you have an increase of, uh, um, of people coming there and putting in more nutrients into the, into the river systems and, and, and simply by wastewater from some of the summer houses here. And this led to an increase of, um, of this DTMO, of these algae species between 1994 and 2015 when we did the last uh, measurements where uh, DTMO has really been proliferating in Etlidau Taler um, significantly. Mm. So we did a similar study in the Bulgarian mountains. Um, but if you're interested in this, I can give you more information about um, the spreading of invasive species in natural rivers in Iceland and also in some of our EEA uh, partner countries in Southeastern Europe. Mm. River morphology, this goes into the quantif quantif uh, the assessment of the quality of the rivers. Um, um, and it's the water framework directive that has to be implemented in, in, in Iceland. So there we look at the status of the rivers. Um, so you have here on the left-hand side, uh, side uh, a completely um, dammed or channelized river, which has a very low ecological status. And on the right-hand side, you have a Yosemite National Park where you have um, a, a completely pristine river. And According to the Water Framework Directive, each river has to be classified into four different categories. A completely natural system would be category four, and a completely dammed system would be category one. And we established a method to do this for Iceland. Um, again, don't want to 
go too much into details. The, the report is online, uh, um, can be available, can be made available if someone is interested in this, but it's simply to assess the ecological status of rivers in, in Iceland where we use the method um, developed by a, um, by a French university. <clears throat> Um, another project that we have got ongoing that involves environmental monitoring is actually the spreading of the ash, ash from volcanic eruptions. So this is again the, what I mentioned already before, the Eyjafjallajökull eruption in 2010, where a huge ash cloud was um, going over, over European airspace, and this blocked the aviation in entire Europe. And Yang Shu, uh, the teaching assistant of this course, he was investigating using a LIDAR how to assess uh, and monitor the spreading of the ash and also the turbulences next to Keflavik airport in order to look at environmental processes that might affect the, and, or environmental impacts that might affect aviation um, um, activities at Keflavik airport. <clears throat> so if you're interested in, in, in this project, you can feel Free to contact Yang Shu. Um, so in principle, the outcome of this project is this is what currently pilots see when they uh, approach Keflavik Airport. So they get information about the wind, they get information about the pressure, temperature, visibility, but there's little information about turbulences. Of course, they're, they're, they have uh, information about this wind speed, but what we can provide through the project um, and of Yang Shu and through the processing of the LIDAR data, the LIDAR that I showed before, we can provide um, um, a continuous monitoring of eddy dissipation rates or turbulences around Keflavik Airport. And we can also look at the backscatter from the LIDAR system and assess the concentration of volcanic ash in the atmosphere around Keflavik Airport and, and provide to um, to the pilots approaching Keflavik Airport, additional information regarding the status of the atmosphere around Keflavik Airport. <clears throat> so these are the preliminary result of the thesis of Yang Shu's PhD project. They are available online. You might access them and take a look at the current turbulences at Keflavik Airport or the current um, particle concentration around um, Keflavik Airport by visiting LIDAR slash visual vedor.is and take a look at it. So then especially in since uh, about two years, we're looking at low carbon energy projects. So this is mostly through the Sustainable Institute and Forum. Um, this is a institute that was established actually two years ago, but officially it's, uh, we are online since last year. Um, there are various different projects ongoing, all investigating um, low carbon um, energy projects or other projects that adhere to the sustainability um, to the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Mm. You might take a look at the website um, and um, get in contact with some of the staff members from Reykjavik University if you're interested in it. One project is methane production at um, Hetlis Heidir uh, geothermal uh, power plant. So here's the Hetlis Heidir um, geothermal power plant. You probably all know this. It produces about 300 um, um, megawatt electricity for Reykjavik city. And associated with the electricity production is about 40,000 tons of CO2 emissions that would be released into the atmosphere if it would not be treated in another way. Since about 2016, since about five, six years, the carb fix project is ongoing where part of the CO2 is mineralized and re-injected into the underground um, and um, is, um, it's a carbon storage project where part of the CO2 emissions are being mitigated simply by mineralizing them and re-pumping them into the, into the um, area. There's also another project right now going on um, in hydrogen production. Um, we'll have a lecture on this hydrogen production plant um, later on during the course. But um, one idea is to use hydrogen um, and store the energy from the hydrogen as methane, simply because methane has a larger market. Methane can be used as natural gas 
and can be mixed with biogas. So it's a very, um, and, and, it, and it can also be used in any combustion engine um, to run a combustion engine. And then it could also eventually be um, reconverted for electricity. So you, in principle, what it would be, it's a storage by using electricity during oversupply during night, for example, produce hydrogen, methanize it, and then produce electricity later on, or use methane directly in combustion engines um, like um, 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 methane cars. <clears throat> so in principle, this methane is exactly the same thing that I mentioned before as the biogas that is produced by, by, um, by, um, by the waste company. But of course here, the concept would be that you use some of the CO2 stream that would be released into the atmosphere and assimilate it into the methane production by using hydrogen and then create a um, climate neutral um, um, fuel because simply you take the CO2 that would be released otherwise into the atmosphere and create methane in it. And then you could argue that from a life cycle perspective, this methane is carbon neutral simply because it, the CO2 has been taken from a stream that would otherwise be released into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So these are ongoing projects. Obviously, 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 during each step, you re, you really you lose part of the electricity or the energy. So you have an efficiency of about seventy-five percent if you produce hydrogen, about sixty-two percent if you produce methane, and then if you reconvert it into electricity, you lose about you only get about thirty-seven percent overall efficiency. So it would be more valuable to use the methane maybe in combustion engines uh, and replace fossil driven cars rather than producing electricity um, simply because of the low efficiency of um, reconverting methane in, or heat into electricity because this is a Carnot process obviously and then you have a rather low efficiency of, a, of in the Carnot process. Okay, any question? I don't see any questions so I will just continue. Um, so this is a I know this slide is in German, but in principle, there are different ways of storing energy. Um, if you have a few seconds, then maybe um, um, uh, batteries are more efficient. Um, if you have, if you want to store energy for several months, then this power to gas um, um, project that I just mentioned before, where you, where you use electricity to produce um, hydrogen or uh, methane could be a very powerful or could be a very useful tool. Pump storage, when you use hydropower to pump up um, water um, could be similar, uh, could be in a similar sector. So in this figure, you just simply have the time scale for storing energy on the um, Y axis and on the X axis, you have the amount of energy that can be stored. Obviously in batteries, uh, you might store a few kilowatts um, while if you have a power to gas, you can have really significant um, energy storage um, uh, um, in it. I also want to mention geothermal energy. Obviously, about 80% of the total energy production, not electricity, but energy production in Iceland comes from geothermal energy. The entire heating of uh, district heating uh, um, is almost entirely geothermally based. And uh, you have, I showed this picture already before from Reketaler stream where you can experience the um, geothermal energy in real life. And in this stream, we have 11 sensors to monitor the, ener the energy, the temperature and the flow, and then to assess um, the, 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 the thermal energy and the hydropower potential of a natural stream like this. So this is simply a small research project where we monitor the, um, the energy um, of fluxes in the Reckertaler stream. So we have a water level logger and temperatures to look at the geothermal and the hydropower potential in that stream. So this brings me more or less to the end, the international collaboration. Um, like I mentioned at the very beginning, we have a, since the beginning of this year, we have with Johannes Kepler University uh, direct collaboration where we intend to collaborate on research and um, and teaching activities um, 
And the reason behind it is Johannes Kepler University has a quite large life cycle analysis group. So if you want, would like to do a life cycle analysis project, then um, you might get in contact with Johannes Kepler University um, because simply they have an experienced team and it could be helpful to use their know-how to um, uh, collaborate with it. <clears throat> we also have um, project collaborations with, of course, with our Scandinavian partners, like I mentioned before, with Finland, the North Snow Network, but also with the southeastern the Balkan countries, um, like for example, um, Hungary, where we looked at um, circular solutions, uh, circular economic solutions, and then of course, also from uh, Hungary, Hungary down to Romania, down to um, Serbia and Bosnia, there are huge unused geothermal sources and we're collaborating with local universities to look into how to use those geothermal sources and maybe replace some of their coal power uh, uh, energy with geothermal sources um, because, um, yeah, because it would be a very cost efficient and a very clean way of replacing at least the district heating in some of the um, localities in Romania, Serbia, Bosnia and Bulgaria by start using by using the technology that has been used in Iceland and implementing it in the Balkan countries to help them shift away from fossil driven heating systems towards something that is more um, that is based on geothermal and this could be cost efficient and um, um, also of course environmentally friendly because the carbon footprint would be a lot lower. So here there's a, there was a, um, a television that interviewed us when we started this project um, um, three years ago. And um, if you're interested, you can take a look into this link. So these are the project partners from um, Serbia, where we have um, three lovely ladies uh, working on geothermal energy in, in Serbia. And just to point this out, this is actually very interesting because in Serbia, um, and also in Romania, geothermal energy was discovered somewhere in the 60s or 70s um, during Soviet times. Um, and at that time, the government um, believed that this was, this was a nice uh, um, resource for recreational purposes, but they never thought of using it as energy um, so source for district heating, simply because at that time, everybody was looking for petroleum they were drilling into it and they found only hot water, were quite disappointed and didn't think of using it as a, as a district heating source. So they are already wellheads and they're already boreholes established, but they're not being used for district heating simply because the system is already set up for coal, um, wood and, and coal heating. And um, it would be a very efficient, energy efficient, and also um, economic efficient way of shifting towards district heating by using some of the existing infrastructure and shifting some of the um, municipalities towards geothermal sources. This is an example from Romania, where also a wellhead exists already, even um, geothermal storage tanks exist. But as you can see here, the, the, the infrastructure has simply been abandoned since 50 years. The, the resources are not being used simply because the system has been set up and focusing on um, coal and um, other fossil um, based um, heating systems. And it would be a very efficient way to shift towards renewable energies. This is a geothermal spa in Western Romania, um, which has been abandoned. Um, and which could be reopened. And just to put it in context, just two years ago, um, Serbia built a new um, coal power plant, while it would probably have been, or at least to our um, conclusions based on the research we have done so far, it might have been um, economically more interesting and environmentally certainly more um, um, sustainable if they would have uh, first focused on geothermal, using the geothermal sources rather than building new, new coal power plants in, in, in Serbia. Um, so this is, brings me to the very end of my lecture. Um, feel it's now up to you to 
think of a project that you would like to focus on during the next 12 weeks and that you would like to present at the next, next at the end of the, of the class, feel free to go to my website. You can see um, different projects that have been addressed by um, students in previous years to get inspired and to look what other students have been looking at. Um, for example, one student looked at biosensors to monitor the, the water waste from aluminum smelters. Um, another student looked at um, using renewable energy to um, link it to Europe. Again, I'm not saying that this that, that we are promoting this, but we're looking into the uh, um, technical aspects and environmental aspects of um, 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 exporting energy production. With the Austrian partners, of course, what could be very interesting is this pump storage, um, how to use pump storage in, the, in a new emerging electricity market where energy has to be provided uh, for peak power. Just as an example, you have here uh, Limberg 2 pump storage site where water is being pumped up during night when energy production is low, energy demand is low and um, water is being released back. And actually this is a way of recycling the water um, over 30 to 40 times per year using the same infrastructure several times um, to produce electricity when it's needed um, rather than just having um, a base production um, when you don't have a pump storage site where you cannot pump up and down. So this is also economically very interesting because energy prices fluctuate by two, or, by two to three orders of magnitude um, uh, um, over, uh, well, can fluctuate quite significantly. And in some cases, they can even drop into the negative. So it becomes interesting for, so um, pump storage sites sometimes get even paid to pump up water into the upper reservoirs and then they can get paid again um, when they produce electricity simply because um, some of the fossil-based um, energy technologies, they cannot respond as quickly to the energy demand. I mean, the point is that the, uh, a nuclear power plant or a, or a coal power plant, you can't turn it off within a few seconds and turn it on uh, um, to, and to meet the demand. So pump storage sites are really very efficient ways of um, making the electricity market more efficient uh, and more adapted to the new demands of energy demand. Huh. So this is more or less the end. I, um, I want to emphasize this, of course, in all our projects. Um, I hope that we can preserve the beauty of nature, like Dorsmark is one of the most beautiful areas I've ever seen. Um, beautiful hiking area in southern Iceland. Also the highlands, I, I like them uh, uh, really a lot. Um, and also the different project partners. And um, this brings me to the end of today's lectures. lecture. I have a video that I do, the, a video of the day. I'll let you watch this by yourself. So this is about the, this, uh, this um, um, by the fisheries. There's every year a competition to come up with, um, with sustainable solutions for, in the fishery. And actually um, Julia, um, was a student of mine, a master student, and she from the Netherlands, and she came to Iceland and participated in this competition and actually won it together with um, three other, four other colleagues. And um, it's an example of um, 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 sustainable, well, she looked at the sustainable uh, engineering solution in the fishery sector and um, was then invited to the US to present their um, sustainable engineering solution um, at a, United States University. This brings me to an end. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, um, we would um, stop here and we would meet Thursday to discuss um, the, your projects. Those of you who have already an idea of what you would like to do for a project, please um, prepare a five minute presentation for Thursday to present the topic so that we can discuss it if it's suitable for the class. Um, I just wanna make sure that it's not too big the project and that, that, we, that, that everybody has a project that can, be, that can be, that it's realistic to do it within the 12 weeks we have. Um, yes, yeah, so if there's no,
question. I don't see any questions. Otherwise, we would just. Um, I would like to wish you a, a a nice afternoon and look forward to your project ideas next Thursday. Yes. And so there's one question: if the project is individual or in groups of pairs, yeah, the you can do the project in, in groups of peers. You can be maximum two students together. So if you have a colleague that would like to work on the same topic, um, then of course, uh, um, you can feel free to do so. Personally, I, I encourage teamwork because it's always good to get experience in working with other team members. So um, the, the answer is yes, you can do it as, as pairs of two. Um, but still, I really would like that everybody engages in the projects so that so um, it's not possible to do it than more than two persons. And obviously, I will take this into account. If you are, if two persons do the, do a project, then I would expect that you go a bit further into detail than if you were to do the project by yourself. Any further questions? All right, besides, look at, this is the background, um, um, so just to show the beauty of the Icelandic highlands. So um, um, it's on top of, of one of the mountain peaks around Siklufjordr where you can do very beautiful um, ski touring ex experiences and um, enjoy the beauty of the Icelandic nature. Okay, thank you very much. We'll meet on Thursday and have a nice start into the year. See you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.